Hi, my name is Ramon Cáceres, and I'll be describing uh, the Zanzibar authorization system. This is joint work with a great many people. <laughs> so determining whether online users have permission to access digital objects is central to preserving privacy online. So for example, here we have on the left, uh, user Alice posts a video on a video sharing service such as YouTube. And the question arises, can another user, in this case Bob on the right, access the video? Now there are many examples of the need for these authorization checks in any service that allows users to share objects. It could be videos, photos, documents, locations, uh, calendar entries, et cetera, et cetera. So Zanzibar is a, is a system that uh, does these authorization checks for hundreds of uh, Google services. Uh, we have a few examples here. Um, again, YouTube, uh, Photos, Drive, Google Cloud, et cetera. So Zanzibar serves two main purposes. The first one is to store access control lists or permissions. So we have two examples here. Um, YouTube acting on behalf of its users um, it stores in Zanzibar, which is the orange uh, cylinder in the middle, um, a permission that says the video X is public, for example. Uh, another example, uh, the Google Cloud platform may store in Zanzibar a permission that says that Group Y manages Cloud Project Z. The second purpose of Zanzibar is then to perform authorization checks based on those stored permissions. So for example, um, YouTube may ask um, Zanzibar at a later date when a, when a user comes to try and access a video, can Alice view video X? Or when a, a cloud user comes to use a, a, a virtual machine, um, the cl Google Cloud service can come ask Zanzibar, can Bob create a virtual machine under Cloud Project Z? So Zanzibar has a number of um, notable properties that really come from requirements of, of a system such as this. Zanzibar should be consistent. Um, and by that I mean that it, it needs to respect the causal ordering of updates to access control lists and object contents in order to allow its uh, clients and users to reason about when it is that permissions are there or not there. This is very important for privacy. Zanzibar needs to be flexible to support a very rich variety of access control policies. We have hundreds of services that are our clients, and they have very, very widely different access control um, patterns. Zanzibar needs to be scalable. Uh, many of our client services are themselves global. They work worldwide. They have uh, a bill, over a billion users, some of them, and they manage billions of objects. So. Um, um, Zanzibar has, has been shown to scale to trillions of access control entries and millions of access authorization checks per second, as we'll see. Um, finally, and, uh, in terms of performance, Zanzibar needs to be fast. Authorization checks are often in the critical path of user interactions. And in, in the case of uh, a search application, for example, it may do tens or hundreds of authorization checks before it can present a single search result that's, that's, that's ACL aware. So in this, in this case, uh, Zanzibar is, uh, has very good tail latency of less than 10 milliseconds at the 95th percentile. And finally, a system like Zanzibar needs to be highly available. And the reason is that if an authorization system is not there, its client services must assume that the answer to an authorization check is no for privacy reasons. And so if the authorization system is not there, there's uh, a huge denial of service problem. So how does it work? So what happens is, um, is our clients get to create arbitrary namespaces. And there's a, a one namespace roughly per every type of object, say a video, videos or photos or documents, et cetera. Within those namespaces, our clients define arbitrary relations between users and objects. Examples of relations are owner, editor, commenter, viewer, et cetera. And Zanzibar stores these uh, this information that comes from, from our clients in uh, what we call relation tuples, which is a row in this table. 
A relation tuple is a three tuple, consists of an object, a relation, and a user set. So here we have two examples. The first one uh, states that user A is a viewer of object of video X. And the second one states that all users are viewers of video Y. All users is just a system constant that is how we implement public objects. So when it comes to check uh, authorizations, uh, Zanzibar will read its stored relation tuples and evaluate the check. So for example, the question comes, is user A a viewer of video X? The answer here is yes. Is user B a viewer of video X? The answer is no. User B does not appear in the, in the access control list for video X. And since uh, video Y is public, all users are viewers of video Y. So the answer is always yes for that. So things get a little more complicated, or actually a lot more complicated, because uh, user sets, that third column in the table, can be more than just a single user or all users. They can also be a set of users that have a, a certain relation to a certain object. It's a, it's a, it's a way of, of having an indirection here. So in this example here in the second row, we have that in addition to user A being a, a viewer of video X, all the members of group one are also viewers of video X. And to, to evaluate that, Zanzibar needs to expand that uh, indirection and go to another namespace, in this case, groups, and see who are the members of group one. So um, you, you can imagine that this creates uh, sometimes very deep hierarchies of permissions, sometimes very wide hierarchies of permissions. And this is a challenge when you want to evaluate an authorization check with low latency. So if we want to do um, authorization checks here, for instance, user B, is it, is it a viewer is of uh, video X? The answer is yes, because it's a member of group one, whereas uh, user D is still not a viewer of video X. I hope that's clear. So uh, another, subtle, another important and subtle point here is that our clients very much care about the order in which um, Zanzibar is able to apply changes to access control lists and to object contents. And in particular, it wants to, they want to protect against what we call the new enemy problem. And here's an example. This, uh, again, user Alice has, decided, has been sharing a document with users Bob and Charlie. And sadly, despite the fact that Alice and Bob have been appearing together in talks and papers like this one for more than 30 years. They've had a recent falling out. And uh, Alice then decides uh, she, she's not going to work with uh, Bob anymore. So she removes them from the access control list for this document. And it's important now for the system, the service, to not allow Bob to access any new contents that may be added to, document, to the document after Bob was removed from the access control list. He had access to it before, so he's already aware of, of all the contents earlier, but maybe uh, Alice and Charlie want to add new sensitive information or new you know, confidential information that Bob should not see. So Zanzibar solves this problem by offering a consistency protocol that it executes in cooperation with its services. All our client services are uh, uh, friends of ours. <laughs> They're all... Google services, so we are in, we, we work in cooperation with them. It's not an adversarial situation. So the first step of this consistency protocol is in this example, Alice has removed Bob from the access control list. So the document service sends a request to Sansabar to remove Bob from the um, uh, as a viewer of document X. And the key to this consistency protocol is to exploit um, the linearizable commit timestamps provided by the underlying database system, which in this case is Spanner. It's a fascinating database system. I, if you don't know about it, I invite you to, uh, to read this paper uh, from 2012. But um, in particular, we use these commit timestamps to mark the order in which events happen in Zanzibar. And so this uh, change to the access control list for document X receives timestamp T0. And Zanzibar will return that timestamp to the client in case it wants to use it later. By continuing with this particular example, what we really want to protect against is, is these new content updates. 
So when, when another user with permission to update the content, in this case Charlie, could be Alice or anyone else, uh, the, the uh, document service will then send uh, another request to Zanzibar to check whether this content update is allowed. In this case, the answer, let's assume the answer is yes. But this, and the important thing is this content update will receive a new timestamp. And Zanzibar will ensure that this timestamp T1 is larger than the timestamp T0 for the uh, uh, ACL update. And finally, when, let's say, Bob tries to access this document, then um, the document service will send a check, an ACL check for Bob to view document X, but it will send back the, the timestamp that Zanzibar had sent the document service before. So the document service will have associated that timestamp with the version of the document in its own storage system, separate from Zanzibar. And now Zanzibar can evaluate this ACL check, knowing that it needs to do so at a timestamp at least as fresh as T1, and it does so. And this, this protocol ensures that Bob cannot access new, new contents of the document after Bob was removed from the access control list. So how, how does Sansbar work inside? So it's a very large system. Uh, starting from the top, we have clients and we have a small, well-defined API. The two, things, the two parts of the API we've been talking about so far are write and check. Writes are used to create, modify, or delete access control entries or relation tuples. Check is this authorization check that I've been talking about. Uh, there's two other read-only APIs, read and expand, that they allow our clients to read back their ACLs and reason about them. There's one other API called Watch, which uh, provides our clients with a near real-time stream of changes to their ACLs. This is a very useful API for clients that want to uh, keep up-to-date indices that are ACL aware for search. Um, when a, say, a check request arrives at, a, um, at Zanzibar, it arrives at, at our main server types called ACL server. These are organized in clusters and requests can arrive at any server in the cluster and that server will farm out work to other servers as necessary. Remember those levels of indirection in the data? Whenever you see one of those, that uh, typically re, uh, results in uh, ACL server doing an internal request to another ACL server to evaluate that part of, of the request. And these things, um, these requests can inf in turn contact other ACL servers. So it's a very rich graph of internal RPCs. This is all remote procedure calls here. So that's how our clusters work. And as I mentioned before, all the data is stored on the Spanner global database system. We have one database for their name, namespace configurations, which is how our clients configure our system with namespaces and relations. And we have one database per namespace to store the relation tuples for that namespace. And finally, we have a change log, which is uh, a record of all the changes to, the, to all the namespaces that it's used by the watch server. So um, satisfying all the requirements of a system like Zanzibar simultaneously uh, presents uh, very difficult engineering challenges. I, I don't have time, unfortunately, to describe the many implementation techniques that we've included in Zanzibar to satisfy these requirements. I invite you to read the paper, but very quickly, um, we have some freedom to choose these evaluation timestamps because that protocol I mentioned, clients will give us a timestamp and they want us to evaluate the check at a time that's at least as fresh as that. But we have, we have freedom all the way back to that timestamp. And often, it turns out clients are satisfied with evaluating timestamps that are more than 10 seconds old or even minutes old. And that gives us uh, the ability to choose a timestamp for data that gives us data that's already been replicated around the world so that we have a, a local copy. So it's, it's, it's in nearby. We have a number of hotspot hot spot mitigation techniques such as caching and deduplication of requests. We hedge requests, which means, this is all internal requests. We hedge requests meaning that we send multiple copies of the same request to multiple servers and take the, fa the one that comes back first. That's a very important technique for reducing tail latency in a, in a distributed system. There's always one slow server somewhere. So if you, if you have bad luck and you're only sending your request to that bad server, you're gonna have high latency. So in some cases, we farm out 
the same request to multiple servers and take the fastest one. We have a lot of fine-grained performance isolation to protect against misbehaving clients. And finally, we use a uh, specialized indexing system called Leopard to optimize op uh, operations on very large or, or, or deeply nested sets. And uh, we, that uh, runs in memory. You can get back, um, return unions and intersections of very large sets in microseconds. So in terms of deployment, Zanzibar has been in production for more than five years. Uh, it manages over 1,500 namespaces defined by hundreds of clients. It stores more than two trillion relation tuples, replicated um, several dozen places around the world. It um, receives more than 10 million requests per second from various clients, mostly read-only kind. And uh, we have over 10,000 servers uh, also in several dozen clusters around the world to serve these requests. So just a, a couple of uh, performance notes here. In terms of load, this is a typical week uh, and how many check queries per second. We have two kinds of check queries. We classify them as either safe or recent. A safe request is one for which the, the timestamp that the client requested is at least 10 seconds old. Again, that means that almost guaranteed we'll be able to find the data at a nearby server because it's already been replicated worldwide by Spanner. We have an eight minute replication heartbeat. I'm sorry, eight, eight second. The other kind is recent. That's when the timestamp requested by the, by the client is, le is less than 10 seconds old. And then in some of these cases, we're gonna have to go to a far away server because the, the data hasn't been replicated yet. So those are slower. But as you can see, uh, the, the great majority of requests are of the safe kind of the fast kind, orders of magnitude more. About four million QPS peaking every week for the safe, whereas only uh, about 100,000 for the recent. In terms of latency, which is one of our major goals here, again, this is the same week. We have different percentiles of latency for check safe, which again is the most common operation by far, orders of magnitude, and we're very proud of the fact that we, we are uh, serving check responses in less than 10 milliseconds at the 95th percentile and less than 100 milliseconds at the 99.9th percentile. Finally, availability, as I mentioned, a very important consideration for an authorization system. And uh, we're very pleased that we've been able to maintain availability over 99.999% over the last three years. If you look closely, you'll see that around New Year's every year, the system seems to take a little break. I don't really know why. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's still very far above the 99.99%. So to summarize, uh, I hope uh, I've convinced you that robust author authorization checks are central to preserving privacy online. It's Ansibar is a unified authorization check, authorization system for Google services, and it respects causal order of user actions, supports a wide variety of access control policies, it offers very low latency, very high availability, scales to trillions of access control lists and millions of checks per second to support hundreds of services used by billions of people. And um, please come to our poster tonight if you'd like to learn more. Thank you very much. Before any questions, uh, is our final speaker here? Where is, okay, okay. So yeah, any questions? Okay. Peter Desnoyers, Northeastern. Um, it was, this is fascinating. Um, I was curious, the, the relations, are those opaque or are they semantic? Do you have semantic knowledge of what viewer means or member? So um, Zanzibar does not understand the semantics of the relations. We, they're fully defined by our clients uh, in their configuration files. We simply check for matches whether um, users have uh, certain relations to certain objects. Okay, thank you. I suspected yeah. that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi. Anna Kornfeld Simpson, University of Washington. Uh, really cool work. Uh, I was wondering, uh, since uh, you know that your clients are other Google services and you have this watch server already, whether you could uh, end up with something along the lines of uh, the key transparency work where clients would be able to sort of 
uh, keep a, I don't know, internal in this case, but internally public track of uh, any changes that have been made and recorded by the system. Well, thanks. I am, I'm not familiar with the key transparency work. I, I'd love to learn more afterwards. Uh, but um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure I can answer your question. I, I'm just not familiar with, with that. Um. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Sasha Sandler from Oracle. Uh, is that a global system, meaning that does it span worldwide, or is it uh, a system that is local to some yeah, region? Yeah, our production instance is, is global. We, um, we have uh, 10,000 servers on, in several dozen uh, data centers all around the world to be close to our users and our services, and our clients, uh, for latency and also for high availability. And the data is also replicated globally. Um, again, uh, several dozen times all around the world, again, to be close to our clients and our users for, for both uh, la low latency and availability. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Okay.